Today's message is titled, Stop Sinning. And this may be perhaps the biggest lie in the Christian church today is that you can't stop sinning. And I'm going to prove to you using the scriptures that that is a lie. Now, I'm not preaching that a Christian can't sin after they've become a Christian. That's not what I'm preaching. That would be a lie. It is possible for us to sin all the way until the resurrection when we have the new body. However, you can stop sinning. Every addict who's been set free from Jesus, by Jesus, and set free from their addiction, knows that this is true. They know that this is true because they used to engage in this sin daily and now they're 10 years away from it and they haven't done it anymore. So it's true that you can be free from sin. Say, it's true. It's true. I can be free. I can be free. I can be free. Jesus, when he says who the sun sets free is free indeed in John chapter eight, is talking about sin. The context is sin. So we're going to talk about that today because I've been getting a lot of pushback from other believers all, you know, saying, oh, you're just going to keep on sinning. You're going to keep on sinning. First off, I don't believe anything unless it is written. So show me in scripture where it says after meeting Jesus under all conditions, you cannot stop sinning. The scriptures do not teach that and we'll be able to show that. Those of you joining us online, thank you for joining us on YouTube. Make sure you like this video, subscribe to the channel and share it with your friends so that they can hear the word of God as well. And thank you all those online. You really are loved. You are dearly beloved by the Lord, whether you're here in person or online. We're grateful for you and Jesus loves you. So let's get into the word. Are you guys ready to hear the word this morning? Yes. Less of me, more of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's read together John chapter five. I'm reading from the NIV. We will switch to literal word after this first one. I just wanted to make sure that we read this translation because you'll see it's about the same as the NASB. However, it uses the words stop sinning, which I like that rendition of the Greek that's what's being said. Okay. So John chapter five, verse 14, before we read it, let me explain the context. Jesus has healed a man and the man didn't know it was Jesus. And then Jesus finds him again after he's healed him in the temple. And this is what he says to him. John chapter five, verse 14. Later, Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, see, you are well again. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. There's a lot to unpack or exegete in that phrase. Okay, so Jesus has healed a man. He then tells him, stop sinning. If you're a Christian who goes, that's impossible, then you can't receive from Jesus on this. You've got to submit to what Jesus has just said. Jesus is not saying something impossible to this man. See, the same mind that thinks that miracles are impossible thinks that stop sinning is impossible. And that's why you're not walking in either. You only receive from God by faith. And so I would encourage you, no matter who you are, that you simply believe these words in red. You are well again. Who did it? Jesus. So we have faith for healing. Stop sinning. Who said it? Jesus. So we believe that we can because he said to do so. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. This is also really interesting. May happen. What does that mean? Well, God is not the author of sickness on mankind. Does he permit sickness? You betcha. Okay, everybody always points to the Old Testament. Look at the Hebrew. Typically, the meaning of the word when he's talking about he sent forth sickness or what have you. Is he permitted? He permitted. Let me point out Moses with the serpent on a pole, which actually a lot of the medical industry uses that imagery, bizarrely enough. That serpent on the pole represents Jesus because he's despised. The snakes would bite people while they weren't looking at Jesus. While they weren't looking at this despised one on the pole, they were bit and they were poisoned and they were made sick. God permitted the snakes to bite them if they weren't looking at Jesus. He did not permit the snakes to bite them if they looked to Jesus or the despised one on the pole. That's what that whole story is about. That story represents healing and how it works. And I'm amazed that hospitals use this imagery because what that imagery expresses is if you don't look to Christ, you'll be sick. If you look to Christ, you'll be healed. That's the simplicity of that message. So all the medical industry attests to this fact, whether they know it or not, 
that if you look to Christ, you'll be healed. If you're not looking to Christ, if you're in the world, you're doing other things, you'll be bit by snakes, you'll be dying. Is that wild? Okay, so that's the Old Testament understanding of how healing works. Are there more scriptures to discuss? Yes, but that's not my primary goal today. We're going to discuss stop sinning or something worse may happen. May happen. What does that mean? It means that you give a foothold to the enemy when you're walking in sin. Even one sin. That's why you should repent. But if you're perpetually walking in habitual sin, this is why things get worse and worse and worse. Not because Jesus is bringing it on you. No more than that serpent on the pole brought it on to the people. But because you've looked away. You see this in the New Testament as well. Think about Peter. Peter's in a storm with all the disciples. Jesus is walking on water. They think it's a ghost. Ah, they're terrified. They realize, no, it's Jesus. Oh, and Peter says, what? Tell me to come out, Lord. Call me out to you. And what, what, what does he say? Come, come on out. Peter fixes his eyes on Jesus and walks on water. This is not possible in the natural. It was a supernatural experience. This is a miracle. Okay. How do miracles happen? They do not happen by focusing on the natural. They only happen by focusing on Jesus. And Jesus is the word made flesh. So really, you can say that it's by focusing on Jesus and on his word that a person experiences the miraculous. Peter then sinks when he starts to stare at the storm and the waves and becomes filled with fear. Walked on water and sunk in the same story. Isn't that interesting? Very similar to the serpent story. When the people looked at the serpent, healed. When they were not looking, bit by snakes, dying. Okay? Same for us. Something worse may happen to you. Nothing bad is going to happen to you if you fix your eyes on Jesus. But here's the work of the word in you. The work of the word will release you from sin. It won't just forgive you. It will release you from sin. Yes, it's a miracle. Yes, it's a miracle. Just like walking on water, just like staring at that serpent on a pole and being healed. It is a miracle of God, but it is a possible miracle to stop sinning. Not that it is impossible for you to sin. Did Peter sink after walking on water? Yep. So it is still possible for a person to sin after they have stopped sinning. And the scriptures address that. Confess your sins that you can be forgiven. However, you can stop. Yes, it's a miracle. So is walking on water. So is being healed by staring at a snake on a pole. These are all miracles. So when you stop sinning, you'll know it's a miracle. I can tell you where I've stopped sinning in my life, my habitual sins, where I've stopped sinning, which I've talked about before, adult films and all that. Sexual sin has been my thing. Maybe your thing is greed or bitterness or something, money, whatever. For me, it was sexual sin. How did I get free? A miracle. How's the miracle come? The word of God. And we're going to talk about that. Fixing your eyes on Jesus. This message is so important. I'll tell you why it's important. Last week's sermon, I took a one minute clip from the message just calling people to repentance. As in the days of Noah, so shall it be the coming of the Son of Man. Took that clip. The Holy Spirit told me to put it on uh, TikTok. So I put it on. I put it on the same day that I preached it, which is a lot faster than I normally would. And over the last week, 100,000 people, over 100,000 people saw that clip. Tens of thousands clicked like. Hundreds of comments. But here's something that popped up a lot. Lots of amens. There were a number of issues from different people. But there are a lot of people who had an issue with obedience and with works, with obeying God, with not sinning, essentially. And there's a deception in the church. It's called hyper grace. And it leads people to think that one, grace is a license for immorality. And two, that they can't stop sinning. Both of those are a lie. And that's why we're going to talk about this today. You can stop sinning. We just read it from Jesus. And if you don't stop, something worse may happen to you. Are you interested in learning about this topic? If you are, say amen. Amen. All right. So we'll switch over to uh, the the literal word app now. This is a free app. You can download it on the app store. Now, this is the NASB, but it essentially says the same thing. John 5, 14. Afterwards, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, Behold, you have become well. Do not sin anymore so that nothing worse happens to you. It's the same, as you can see. I just wanted to read Stop Sinning. 
because I think that's a quick way to say it. Do not sin anymore is the same as saying stop sinning. Stop sinning. All right, let's read John chapter 8. This is going to be a good one, folks, because it's the Word of God. John chapter 8, verses 10 uh, and 11. This is the story of the woman caught in adultery. The very important story. You should read the whole thing. We're just reading those last two uh, verses, 10 and 11. But the woman caught in adultery is caught in the act of sexual sin. And the law of Moses says to stone her. The Pharisees bring her before Jesus. Jesus doesn't disagree. This is the first thing that I notice about this story. He doesn't disagree. The wages of sin is death. He does not disagree that the punishment for sin is death. That's true for all of us. Folks, that should be a motivator to come to Christ. That is true. So Jesus doesn't go, because people try and teach that like, oh, Jesus was so chill and he didn't believe in the law of Moses. No, no, no. He, in, he wrote the law of Moses. He inspired the law of Moses. He's the one who will bring the punishment of death if you don't believe and receive forgiveness of sin. So he doesn't disagree with them, but he does say something very profound. He says, you who's without sin, cast the first stone. That's the first part of the story that's real famous. You who are without sin, cast the first stone. Well, the elders, they drop their stones first. The young guys like me, they drop them last. Because the younger you are, the more you think, oh yeah, I'm a hot shot. I haven't committed any sins. The older the, you are, the more obvious it is that you're a sinner. And when you think about your sins, you've definitely committed sins that were worthy of being stoned to death in the Old Testament. Definitely. Have you ever dishonored your parents? I have. I've dishonored my mother who's sitting right here and I repented of it, but I have. Well, you know what the Old Testament says? They would ta be taken out by the parents or the priest and be stoned to death. You on the day you dishonor your parents. Wow, we. A guy went and gathered sticks on the Sabbath. You see God's grace on the Sabbath every Saturday. A guy went and gathered sticks on the Sabbath. Stoned him to death for gathering sticks on the Sabbath. Wow, we. This is wild stuff. I mean, read the law, folks. You are, you are worthy of death according to the law. And Jesus agrees. But what he said was, he who's without sin cast the first stone. In other words, if you all actually kept the law fully, you'd all be dead. You'd have to stone each other to death until you're all dead. I'm serious. You would. If you really kept it faithfully, You'd all be dead. <laughs> Truly. You realize God even came to kill Moses? God came to put Moses to death because he didn't circumcise his son. You know that's a... That's a go, go read your Bible. God came to put him to death. He repented and God had mercy and they circumcised the son real fast. Okay, so if even Moses was worthy of being put to death, you aren't? Okay, I'm just trying to make a point. The Holy Spirit's making a point. I'm not going to, you know, stay on this all day. But the point is, we're worthy. The wages of sin is death. Okay. Jesus says, he who's without sin casts the first stone. You'd put, all, you'd put each other to death if you really kept the law. All right. So how does Jesus respond? So important. Does not stone the woman to death. Gives her time. I'm not saying she's not worthy of death. And neither was Jesus. I'm saying that God is patient. That's what I'm saying. Thank God for his patience and mercy. He's patient with you. This is what the scriptures say in Peter. God is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Hallelujah. God is patient with me and you because he doesn't want one person to die and to perish in hell. Not one. That doesn't mean people won't go to hell. It just means that God is eager for people to be saved. Yeah. He is for us, not against us. But he does not overwrite will, which is another talk I've preached plenty of sermons on. He will not overwrite will. You see it with Jonah. Jonah could keep going to Tarshish if he wanted, but he needed to head to Nineveh or he was going to die. So God can be uh, very compelling in his reasons for you to do what he says. Uh, if you don't do what I say, you will die. Yes. But the truth is, he could have chosen to die. Yeah. It's true, you still got the choice. Okay. So he is without sin, casts the first stone. No one casts any stones. Jesus doesn't either. Thank you, Jesus. And here's what he says to her in verses 10 and 11. 
Straightening up, Jesus said to her, Woman, where are they? Did no one condemn you? And I want you to understand something. There's a difference between condemnation and judgment and then rebuke. He's going to correct her, but he doesn't condemn her. And there's a difference. Listen, super important. There's a difference between rebuke and judgment. The world and a lot of Christians call judgment Every, everything is judgment. They call rebuke judgment. They call uh, adhering to Jesus's word and teaching people to obey his commands. They call that judgmental. That's not judgment. Judgment would be to stone her to death. That's judgment. That's condemnation. Do you understand? He says, has anyone condemned you? In other words, has anyone stoned you to death? No, then neither do I condemn you. In other words, I'm not going to stone you to death. Praise God. Then he rebukes the woman. What does the word rebuke mean? It's just a religious term. It just means to correct or to point someone in the right direction. Okay, sometimes it's harsh, sometimes it's gentle. Here it's gentle. Peter corrects Simon the sorcerer harshly in the book of Acts. So you'll see harsh rebuke, gentle rebuke. Neither are judgment. Neither are condemnation. Do you understand? Now, there is an understanding of judgment, meaning like making a decision between something. Okay, but then there's another form of judgment and Sometimes the better word is condemnation, and that is where you punish them physically for the sin. Does that make sense? You stone them to death. That would be condemnation. That would be true judgment. That would be not just decision making, but carrying out the decision. Whereas rebuke is verbal. And what does he say in verse 11? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, I do not condemn you either. Go from now on, sin no more. This is a rebuke, not a judgment. This is what we should be doing with one another, correcting each other with the word of God because we love each other. What did he say earlier in John 5? What did he say to the man? He said, stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. That, and that was true, right? He's doing the same thing with this woman. He's saying, stop sinning. Why? Something worse may happen to you. What happens if you keep living the adulterous life? Well, in this time, she might get stoned to death. That's one of the things that might happen. But you know what else might happen? She might get a sexual disease. Right? She might get into the Bathsheba situation where she fathers a child with someone who's not her husband. All, all sorts of things. Just difficulties come from sin. Real hard life experiences. So he's, 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 Jesus is not being unkind when he says to the sexual sinner like me, stop it. Jesus isn't judging me when he says to me or you, stop it. He's, trying to protect you. He's protecting you. Amen. And you, as his voice in the earth, are protecting your neighbors when you do the same thing. You are not doing something evil when you tell people to stop sinning. You are trying to protect them from the harm that comes. See, the church is not tolerant of sin. The idea of tolerating sin is not biblical. God is so intolerant of sin that he punished Jesus with the full measure of his wrath for your sins. He is not tolerant of sin. Wow. Do you understand? And if the church tolerates sin, you are trivializing the cross. You are making the cross something unnecessary. Sin is not tolerated in heaven. The moment Satan sinned, he was thrust from heaven like a bolt of lightning to the earth to crawl on his belly as a serpent. God does not tolerate sin. We do not tolerate sin as the church. We are compassionate to sinners. Part of that compassion compels us to do exactly what Jesus did here, and that is to not stone people to death, a.k.a. judgment, but to kindly rebuke them in order to lead them to Christ. Do you know that that's what the scriptures say? It says that God's law is our schoolmaster to lead us to Jesus. That's, its, that's why it exists. Those Ten Commandments... They are supposed to reveal your sin to you so that you can be forgiven and 
set free. Everybody say set free. Set free. People are teaching a half gospel in a lot of different ways. Isaiah 53, 4 and 5 in the Hebrew says that Jesus bore our diseases and our sins. But here's another thing that's wrong that people teach about the gospel. They teach only forgiveness of sin and they don't teach freedom from sin. And that is, again, a half gospel. And God wants us to teach the full gospel. All right. Are you, fo- are you, are you pacing with me? You're following with me? Stop sinning. So Jesus has said it at least a couple of times. Is it said more times? Sure it is. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 15. I'm just making a case. Let every matter be established by two or three witnesses or more. Jesus appeared to 500, over 500 people. So you certainly can establish it by more than two or three. But 1 Corinthians 15, 33 and 34. Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. Become sober minded as you ought and stop sinning. Everybody say stop sinning. Stop sinning. Stop sinning. For some have no knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. The Corinthian church was a Christian church that was actively sinning in all sorts of ways. So much so, in 1 Corinthians 5, there was a man sleeping with his father's wife, and everybody thought that the grace of God enabled him to do it. And Paul had to go, what in the world are you guys believing? Put this man out of fellowship until he repents, and you all repent too. Do you realize that? So the Corinthian church is an example of how the Gentiles tend to act. And I'm telling you, our Gentile American churches seem to be acting this way. We're taking grace and making it a license for immorality. And we are not taking seriously God's command in the New Testament to stop sinning. We think it's not possible. Just like we think walking on water is not possible and healing is not possible and raising the dead is not possible. Those are all lies. The word of God is true no matter what you've seen or experienced. The truth is God's word. That's what John 17, 17 says. Sanctify them by the truth. Thy word is truth. What is the truth? His word. Is your experience the truth? No. No. You go, well, it's physical evidence. I remain sick after praying. Still not the truth. God's word is the truth. And when you start thinking militantly about God's word, that's when you'll experience the miracles. Say the word and my servant will be made well. That's what the Roman centurion said. Say the word and my my servant will be well. And Jesus marveled because he had more faith than anybody else in Israel. Say the word. Everybody say, say the word. Say the word. Why? Why do we believe this? Because thy word, his word is truth. His word is truth. Become sober-minded as you ought and stop sinning. For some have no knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. Let's read 2 Peter chapter 2. We're just establishing with many witnesses that I'm not making things up. All right, so here's the sign of false prophets in 2 Peter 2. Let's start with verses 1 through 3. But false prophets also arose among the people. He's talking about in the Old Testament. He's talking about Balaam. Just as there will also be false teachers among you who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, destructive opinions. You know what heresy is? Opinion. I think. I think. Boasting after having lived for less than 100 years that you know more than the ancient of days. I think. That's a false teacher. A true teacher just reads you the word of God and tries to explain it to you. A false teacher goes, well, I think that we can't stop sinning. What's the word of God say? See, a true teacher says it is written. Jesus always said it is written. Amen. The New Covenant, New Testament preachers always said it is written. False teachers among you who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. How's that possible? Well, the scriptures say in Titus that they claim to know God, but by their actions, they deny him. So a person can profess Christ all day, but by their actions, deny him. That's what Paul said to Titus. Verse two, many, everybody say many. Many Many. Many will follow their sensuality. And because of them, the way of truth will be maligned. Listen, I I know this is true. 
Ministers have to be delivered from sexual immorality. Have to. Have to. This has to be true. You have to be free from it. Why? Because look at all these ministries that get destroyed because of all the sexual misconduct from the pastors. Do you understand? I have to have the mind of Christ and the eyes of Christ and see a woman as my mother or my sister and not as a potential bedmate. I'm, ser- I'm, I'm being real with you yeah. because the SBC just had a bunch of pastors caught. Hillsong had one of its head pastors or the founding head pastor caught. I mean, this stuff has been going on in a lot of different denominations and different churches. And I'm telling you, it stems from thinking that woe is me. I'm always going to sin. When the Bible says stop. OK, and God made this very clear to me. You are you are if I'm going to. Have you preached to more people? You have to be cleansed. Oh, yeah. Amen. Oh, yeah. There is no, you know, because I've already seen, and it's, it's God's love. I've already seen those who have come before me. I've been part of groups where the pastors have slept with married women in the, in the crowd and all that. Okay? That's why I speak about it openly. That helps to keep that Bring stuff at light. bay. Um, but two, these are all people that didn't really practice or believe freedom from sin. And I believe that you can be free from sin. And I'm going to show it to you. Hopefully we're already starting to see it, but as more of the word gets poured into you, you should see it clearer and clearer. Many will follow their sensuality. And because of them, the way of truth will be maligned, which it is. Every time these pastors and priests are caught up in sexual misconduct or even financial misconduct, any kind of misconduct, the way of truth is maligned. It is, isn't it? And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Their judgment from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. Greed, peddling the word of God for profit, is the way Paul put it in Corinthians. He said, unlike so many, we do not peddle the word of God for profit. These guys do. They're greedy, they're sensual, and they end up denying Jesus because they teach grace as a license for immorality. Woo! All right, verses 13 and 14, same chapter, just scroll down. Suffering wrong is the wages of doing wrong. They counted a pleasure to revel in the daytime. They are stains and blemishes, reveling in their deceptions as they carouse with you. Having eyes full of adultery, they never cease from sin. Do you see? I'm not making this up. False teachers... Never cease from sin because they don't teach that you can stop sinning. Am I, man, am I, are you getting this? Yes, amen. False teachers, how do you identify them? Because they'll preach from the Bible, just like any other preacher will. How do you identify a false teacher? By their conduct, sensuality, greed. There's other things listed. It's a long chapter. But they also never cease sinning. And you'll know that they've never ceased sinning by whether they preach on freedom from sin or not. See, if you go to an addiction recovery ministry, the minister will be the first one to tell you, you absolutely can be free from that sin. When you walk into a, a, a church and the pastor, you go talk to him about stop sinning and he doesn't have anything from the word to where he says, yeah, you can be free and you can stop sinning. Boy, Mm -mm. He's probably got some sins or she she, that they're not dealing with. And I, you know, I'm not God. So go where God tells you. But I personally would recommend that you find another teacher. Because if somebody comes into this church and they go, brother, I really want to get free from blank sin. And I go, well, brother, you know. We all struggle with sins. And I don't give them hope. That's not the Bible. Who the sun sets free is free indeed. That's what the Bible teaches. That's what I'm supposed to express to other people. The truth. The full gospel. Having eyes full of adultery that never cease from sin, enticing unstable souls, having a heart trained in greed, accursed children, forsaking the right way, they have gone astray, having followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. Let me tell you something about Balaam real quick. 
Okay, you should read his story and become acquainted because he's brought up in the New Testament multiple times. Balaam was a prophet who did speak to God and did rightly prophesy over Israel. This is where it gets tricky with Balaam. Okay. Listen, he was a bad prophet. Here's why. Though he communed with God on one side of his life, and he actually did what God said on one side, he also loved money. Balaam loved money. And a king had offered him lots of wealth if he would curse Israel. And he couldn't curse Israel because as a prophet, God wouldn't let him. And so he could only speak a blessing over Israel. Every time he went to curse them, he could only bless them. And so the king became exceedingly frustrated with Balaam. So what did Balaam do? Balaam, in his wicked heart, thought of a way that he could both do what God said and do what the king wanted. Are you listening? He wanted to do what God said and do what the king wanted. And here's what he did. He thought of a way. He thought, oh, king, I know how sin works and I know how consequences work. He said, compel them and entice them to commit sexual immorality. And then God will be forced to allow them to be destroyed. Yeah, Balaam did this. And then the king paid him a hefty ransom for giving him that knowledge. And it did result in thousands of Israelites committing sexual immorality and being destroyed, coming under judgment. Is that wild? So watch out for Balaam's because what they're doing is on one hand, they are serving the living God. And on the other, they're serving money. On one hand, they're preaching no adultery, maybe sometimes. On the other, they're sleeping with women in their church office. You understand? First off, they're meeting with women alone. Not a good idea. Watch out for Balaam's. What's one of the signs? They never stop sinning. They don't teach it. They don't believe it. And they don't do it. Hebrews 12, 14 through 17. This is pretty eye-opening, isn't it? That's what, that's what the scriptures do. They, they teach us the truth. They open our eyes. <laughs> you realize how blind you are as you read the Bible. You go, oh God, have mercy on me. Open the eyes of this blind man. Hebrews 12, 14. Pursue peace with all men and the sanctification, and the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble and by it many be defiled yes. that there be no immoral or godless person like Esau who sold his own birthright for a single meal for you know that even afterwards when he desired to inherit the blessing he was rejected for he found no place for repentance though he sought for it with tears folks <coughs> notice what's being said here See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God. How? What does it say? That there be no immoral or godless person like Esau. A person who's walking in immorality. Who does not believe they can be freed from sin. And honestly thinks that grace enables them to do it day after day, night after night, dollar after dollar, whatever it is. <clears throat> you understand? If you are enslaved to some sort of habitual sin or any sin, you can be free. You can be free. You're going to learn during this sermon, if you'll pay attention, how to be free. Freedom starts just from believing that you can be. So it's already started. The work's already started if you're believing what's being said to you. But you'll see it in the scriptures soon enough. See, I cook a meal. The Lord has me put together a meal and serve it to you. <clears throat> All right, 1 Peter 1. I am going through these quickly on purpose because I mostly want to focus on how to stop, how to be free. 1 Peter 1, verse 14 through 16. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance. But like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves 
also in all your behavior, because it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. In other words, our trust is in God because God has said you shall be holy. Amen. See, I'm not talking about personal effort. I am talking about a miracle. But miracles come by believing what has been said by God. And God says, you shall be holy. Amen. Now, a lot of people will go, well, sure. I mean, in heaven, sure. But the Bible teaches before heaven Amen. that you will stop sinning. Amen. Again, I know how everybody's alarm bells go off. Yes, you could have 10 years of not committing a sin and commit it. I'm aware of that. I understand that. You confess your sin and you're forgiven and you get back on the horse and stop sinning. Do you understand? Yeah. So I'm not saying it's impossible to sin. What I'm saying is it's possible to stop. Yeah. Hallelujah. You can be both forgiven and free. Why? Because the Bible says, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior. Is Peter talking to some heavenly host in the future right now? Or is he speaking to the church? Yeah, his epistles written to the church, isn't it? And he's saying to the church, be holy in all your behavior. Hello, if Peter preached that, then the preachers of today need to preach it. Be holy in all your behavior, folks. That's what the Bible teaches. That's not being judgmental. That's why we covered that first. It's the word of God. See, if you want to walk in it, believe it. If you want to walk in holiness, believe you can be. <laughs> You're not going to walk in holiness if you believe you can't. I can tell you that. Amen. All the years that I wrestled with it, yeah, I did not walk in holiness. How do you start walking in holiness? Believe it. Believe it. Believe what you're reading, that it's true. Start there, folks. But like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior, because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Holy. If you address as father, the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves in fear during your, the time of your stay on earth, knowing that you are not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. Jesus blood does the work of both forgiving a person and freeing a person. Amen. But it's just like anything in the Bible. The reason why Christians walk in forgiveness but not freedom is because they're not believing freedom's possible. And the Lord has set this on my heart to preach this the same way that we need to preach healing. Because the reason why people aren't walking in healing is because they first don't believe it's possible or that it's not God's will for them. It's the same for freedom. They're not walking in freedom because they don't believe it's possible. But all things are possible. For them that believe. Amen. Right. So how do we stop? Everybody say, how do, how do we stop? How do we stop? What a great question. Would you like to know the answer to that question? Yes. Well, good. Oh, for some one. Good. I want you to know the answer to that question. The Lord wants you to know the answer to that question. First John 1, starting from verse 8. We're going to read 8 through 10 right here. Okay. I want to start with confession of sin so that nobody's getting beat up in here. OK, let's start here. This is where John starts his epistle. So let me tell you something about John's first epistle. And in fact, all three of them. But the first one. John starts with confess your sins and be forgiven. And he starts with Jesus being the atonement for our sins. That's where he starts. But you know how he spends the rest of the chapters? And you'll see this. Stop sinning. That's how, he's, that's how he spends the rest of the time. He doesn't just teach forgiveness. He teaches freedom. OK, so let's start with where he started. Forgiveness. First John 1, 8 through 10. If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. Have I said that I'm sinless as I preach this sermon? No, that's one of the first things they accuse the teacher of. Oh, oh, no, no, no. What I'm saying is I have stopped sinning. Can I still sin? Yeah. And I have, but I've stopped sinning. It's not a habit in my life. Do you understand? It's not. I can't say that to you and, and, and be right with God if it's a lie. Right. I'm testifying to his power, not me. Amen. It's the truth of his word. So have I sinned in my life? Yes. 
So I've already qualified as being able to teach you here because I'm not proclaiming that I have no sin. That's a lie. That would be somebody coming along and being like, Jesus wasn't the Messiah. I'm the Messiah and I'm sinless. That's how you know. Okay. (laughs) Verse nine. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. unrighteousness. Praise God. If you confess your sins to the Lord, even as a Christian, who is John writing to? The church. This is a letter to the church. This is not a letter to unbelievers. So he's writing to Christians and he's saying, if you've sinned, you can confess your sins. He's faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And that word cleanse means both ethically and physically. The record of wrongs is wiped away and the body is healed. So, Lord, we confess our sins and we thank you for your forgiveness. Verse 10, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Again, pay very close attention to the words I'm saying to you. I have sinned and I have the atonement of Christ, but I have also stopped sinning continually and habitually and perpetually. And my example would be adult films. Do you understand? Does that mean it's impossible for me to be tired and lonely and get onto my phone in the middle of the night? No, that's not what I'm preaching. I'm just preaching that I've stopped. And you can stay where you are with not sinning by staying in the word. And I'm going to show you that. All right. So 1 John 2, next chapter. We're going to go to 1 John 2. Very important. 1 John 2, verses 1 through 6. Still, this is really the intro of John's letter still. And he says, my little children, I'm writing writing these things to you so that you may not sin. In other words, the whole reason for writing this letter and the reason why the Holy Spirit has inspired me is to help you not sin. Why wouldn't we teach not sinning? If sin is what puts Jesus on the cross... Why would a preacher of Jesus not teach you to not sin? It's goofiness. God help the church. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. In other words, he is the ransom. He is the payment for our sin. And those are the whole world, meaning we can preach this gospel to the whole world because there's enough blood for everyone. Hallelujah. So notice where John's starting. It's where I'm starting as well. I am preaching this so that you will not sin. If you do sin, you have an advocate in Christ Jesus and you can confess your sins and be forgiven. This is true. This is where the devil will lie to people. Let's say you get freed from an addiction and you've been free for 10 years and you fall into a hard time in life and you, and you do it. You do it after 10 years. You have an advocate in Christ Jesus. Amen. Salvation is not by works. Do you understand? Yes. Okay. You have an advocate and you have mercy. But you can get right back into being free. Amen. You don't have to descend into this life of five more years of addiction. You can get right back into freedom. Amen. The same day that you had committed that sin. Yes, same day. I'm serious. Right. Hallelujah. In a moment. Thank God. Now, he continues on, and this is where he starts to get more serious. <laughs> right? Because he's moving on from forgiveness and he's moving on into freedom. Yeah. Verse 3. By this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Ooh, it's already, yeah. it's already heavy. You know that you know Jesus if you're keeping his commandments. Yeah. If you're not... You need to wake up and pay attention. Verse four, the one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. Boy, oh boy. Okay, so we've moved from forgiveness almost right away into, and you better be obeying Jesus. In other words, this forgiveness is not for you to live in rebellion to the Lord. This forgiveness is so you can get back on the horse and keep riding in freedom and obedience. 
Hallelujah. Boy, there are a lot of people who are not ready for this word, and yet it's, it is the word of God. Lord, soften our hearts. The one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar. Man, I'm glad John said it, so I don't have to. Is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, Amen. keeps his word, in him the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we're in him. I know they put a colon there. I think it's supposed to be a period. That's my personal grammatical uh, understanding. That's supposed to be a period. Because that's the context of what he's saying in those three verses. So we know we've come to know him. How? By keeping his word. By keeping his word. What did Jesus say in John 8? And you shall know the truth. And the truth shall make you free. All right. So how is a person walking in the commands of God? How are they really obeying Jesus and not living in sin and not using grace as a license for immorality? They keep his word ever before their eyes and in their ears. They're dwelling on it and then they're doing what it says. Amen. Telling you we're starting to see it. But whoever keeps his word in him, the love of God has truly been perfected. By this, we know that we are in him. <clears throat> the one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he, we're talking about Jesus, as Jesus walked. Amen. The same way Jesus lived is how we're to live. Amen. Was Jesus free from sin? Yes. yes. I am not teaching you that you and I are sinless. Obviously not. We need Christ's atonement. Amen. What I'm teaching you is that Jesus walked in freedom and so can you. And Jesus taught that you can. This is not my teaching. I'm not making this up. I'm not writing a book to sell it to you. This is Jesus' teaching, that you can be free. What did we just read? Oh, it's going to become even more clear. Let's go to 1 John 3, 5. Next one. You know what? I can just scroll. 1 John 3, 5. Okay. 1 John 3, 5, very next chapter. I would love for you to read the whole epistle. Just read through it. Obviously, for a sermon, I'm giving you segments, but read it. Read what John said. You know that he, we're still talking about Jesus, you know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. In other words, as Christians, you know this. You know that Jesus appeared to, to take away sin, to forgive your sins. Okay, the whole Christian church has got that correct. Here's the part where we start to fall off. Verse 6, no one who abides in him sins. Amen. Abide means remain. What is Jesus? He's the word made flesh. No one who abides in the word sins. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has seen him or knows him. What's happening here, John? Yeah. You're saying things that pastors have explicitly stated are not true, and yet here they are in the Bible. So who's right? I would go with John. I, I'd side with John, not Pastor, you know, Jim with the mega church. I would side with John. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has seen him or knows him. Notice sins is plural. We're talking about a habitual, perpetual sinning whether that's an addiction or it's just a defiant declaration that what you're doing isn't sin. And the reason why you think it's not sin is because you're not in the word. And the reason you're not free from it is because you're not in the word. If you're in a habitual sin, the freedom that you can experience is from being in the word. I'm going to show this to you in scripture in just a moment, but let me bring up, there's something called the Total Freedom Program in Orlando. There's lots of programs like this. They're freedom from addiction programs. They have real ministers at them. And here's what these real ministers teach those who come to get free. Read the word every day. And here's what Total Freedom Program does. And I know a lot do it this way, but, but this one, I really like it. They have them listen to the Bible and sermons for hours a day. They put headphones on, they take notes and listen for hours a day. I think it's at least two, two to three hours every day. They're in the word that much. No one stays addicted. No one stays addicted. People get actually free. How is that happening? The word of God is living and active. And when it comes into a person, it pushes out the sin. 
God wants you to be forgiven and free. No one who abides in him sins. One who sins, no one who sins has seen him or knows him. Verse 7, little children, make sure no one deceives you. Amen. Make sure no one deceives you on this topic of freedom from sin because they intend to make you captive to sin just like they are. You know, that's what Peter said to Simon the sorcerer. Simon the sorcerer believed on Jesus and was baptized. Then he wanted to buy and sell the Holy Spirit. This is a good indicator that you're dealing with a false teacher. Not that everything they teach is false, but that they themselves are currently in rebellion to God. And that is that they buy and sell the word of God. That, 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 that God's word and God's system has become a marketplace. I'm telling you, selling books, selling stuff, this is not of God. Make sure that no one deceives you. No one. Who? These guys, these false teachers who say you can't be free and they're greedy. No one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. Let me remind you of something. Jesus said that freely you've received, freely give. Everything God gives is free. Wisdom. Does it come free or does God charge you before he sends it to your mind? It comes free, right? So if he tells you to write it in a book, the book should be available for donation. Free, but available for donation. If God sends you healing, does he charge you before he sends it? No, it's free. If God sends you forgiveness, does he charge you before he sends it? No. Why then do his teachers charge tickets to get in, charge you to read the wisdom that God gave them, charge you for the sermons that they've preached? Charge you, charge you, charge you. God doesn't charge you. Freely you've received, freely give. It's a big indicator who you're dealing with when they're charging you. Even if what they're saying is true, I'm talking about them as a person, not the message. The message might be right. Balaam rightly spoke the blessings of God over Israel. Balaam was evil. Will you practice discernment with me? Discern these things, church. Discern who Balaam is. Little children, make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he, Jesus, is righteous. The one who practices sin, notice it's a practice. It's not I stumbled and fell. It's a practice. It's someone who thinks you can't be free, so they just keep going. No one who practices sin, the one who practices sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. Satan never stops. The Son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. Now here we go. No one who is born of God practices sin because his seed abides in him and he cannot sin because he is born of God. No one who is born of God practices sin because his seed abides in him. It's no surprise. This is the most important verse of the day. And he cannot sin because he is born of God. So first thing, born of God means born again. Born again. Okay. So anyone who is born again, born of God, that person does not practice sin. Uh-oh. We're already in hot water with the teachings and theology of many Christians. Because his seed abides in him. Maybe the Holy Spirit's already told you, what is his seed? What is the seed? Jesus shares the parable of the sower in Luke 8, 11. We're going to read it in a minute, but I want to stay on this verse we're on. It says, this is the meaning of the parable. The seed is the word of God. So now let's read what we're reading with that understanding. With 1 John 3, verse 9. No one who is born of God or born again practices sin because his seed, or you could say the word of God, abides in him. Abides mean, means remain. It's a daily. Abide indicates a daily. <clears throat> See, here's what happens. People will naturally, and I mean supernaturally, but they will automatically, maybe that's the right word, people will automatically start to walk in freedom from sin the more they're diving into the word every day, even if they don't have the doctrine, even if they don't get it. It just happens. But then when they start to distance themselves from the word, they'll go right back into their sins. 
It's a spiritual law, folks. If his seed abides in you, you will not sin. If his seed does not abide in you, you will sin. It's that simple. Look at the fall of man. There's so much to learn from the first three chapters of God's holy book. God spoke his word to Adam and to Eve. You can eat any tree except this one. And they believed it. And they dwelt on that word. They listened to only that word. And they didn't eat of the tree, did they? No. And then a different word came from the serpent. Oh, you will not die if you eat the tree. You'll be like God. They stopped listening to God's word and listened to a different word. Then they began to believe that different word rather than God's word. And God's word was no longer abiding in them. And then they believed the serpent and then they acted against God. They sinned. How did they get to sin? They stopped abiding in God's word. And they began listening to the serpent's word, which really anything other than God is Satan. Any word other than God's is not coming from God and therefore is Satan. You can listen to the spirit, which is God's word, or you can listen to the serpent, self, or someone else. All three of those are not God. So you're either listening to God or one of those other categories. And if God's word does not abide in you, you will sin. And the Holy Spirit is already convicting If you have habitual sin in your life and you've made a practice of sinning, take a look at how much you're reading and listening to the word of God. And if you're honest with self, you'll already know that you are either not in it or barely in it. Just be honest. And I present to you again, these addiction freedom programs, what are they doing? They're doing like two, three hours in the Bible or in sermons every day day and then the person's free folks if you really want freedom I'm not saying you have to go to an addiction recovery program but if the Holy Spirit tells you to do but if you really want freedom do the same things they're doing be in the word for hours a day just be in it people go oh rich you preach too long because I want you in the word because I know it'll have an effect the longer you're in it be in the word See, let's read it again with this understanding. No one who is born of God practices sin because his seed abides in him and he cannot sin because he's born of God. In other words, if you're born again and you have God's word in you, you cannot sin. You won't. You just won't. Where you were weak before, you become strong. Where you used to give in to temptation, you don't anymore. I'm not saying I'm never tempted. I'm just saying I haven't been giving in. I'm free. (laughs) Now, I'm well aware that I can go right back in. I could go right back in. I go right back in. I just have to get out of God's word and I'll go right back to it. Hence why I am just clinging to God's word every day because I'm like, I'm free. This is real stuff, folks. I'm actual free. I get what the addicts say. They're like, no, I don't do it. I haven't done it in 10 years. It's like, I get it. You're in his word. No one who is born of God practices sin because his seed abides in him. And he cannot sin because he is born of God. Verse 10. By this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God. Nor the one who does not love his brother. So if you make a practice of sin, you are not of God. If you do not love your neighbor, you are not of God. Can you repent and be of God? Sure, get to repenting. But if that's the way you're living your life, if you made a practice of sin rather than of righteousness, you are not of God. If you do not love people made in His image, you are not of God. How can you be of God? Be born again by believing in Jesus Christ, receiving the forgiveness of sin, and His seed, His word, remaining in you so that you do not continue in sin. That is how a person experiences freedom. And it's real freedom. This is not, oh, every four days I still do it. We're talking freedom. 
We're talking, you're not doing it anymore because you're in God's word and his word has pushed it out of you. Amen. Jesus said that a person could be delivered of a demon, could cast a demon out, be delivered. Let's say it's a sexual demon. Okay. They're delivered. It says the house is swept clean, but the demon comes back and finds the home unoccupied, not just swept clean, unoccupied. In other words, God's word did its job and cleansed, but they didn't remain. So the word is no longer in them and they're unoccupied. And Jesus said that spirit will bring along seven more spirits, more wicked than itself. And the condition of the person will be worse after than it was before. Is that wild? See, people get these temporary deliverances, but they're not taught stay in the word every day. And it comes back with a vengeance. That happened to me. I actually got free before I got to the freedom that I'm in now. And it came back with a vengeance because I didn't stay in God's word and I didn't realize that that was the key. Nobody else really told me that either. It's not, unfortunately, everyone should believe this, but it's not common knowledge. It should be. That's why I'm preaching it. So you'll all know it too. But I didn't know. It came back with a vengeance. I didn't know I was fulfilling Jesus's word. Came back with a vengeance. Having a harder time with it than I did before. Why? Didn't remain in his word. His seed was not in me every day. That was why. Made that correction. Freedom. Praise God. Freedom. It's real. I can testify to you that this is exactly how it works. I'm speaking in this case, not just as someone who believes it, which I do, but I've experienced it. So now I know it in addition to believing it. Does that make sense? Once you've experienced something, you now are a knower. Okay. Speaking to you as a knower, you need to believe it and you'll become a knower. All right. So we've got to practice righteousness and love our neighbor. Okay, how are we going to do that? We've got to be in God's word. So let's go read that. I I read it to you a moment ago, but Luke 8, 11. Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. Do you see that? The seed is the word of God. What's God's seed? His word. In the parables, when we're talking about the seed, we're talking about the word. When the New Testament talks about the seed, it's the word. The word. But we can see this also in 1 Peter. I'd like you to see so that you get two witnesses. 1 Peter uh, 1, verse 22 and 23. 1 okay. says this. Since you have in obedience to the truth, purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. For you have been born again, not of seed, which is perishable, but imperishable. That is, through the living an enduring word of God. How does a person walk in the obedience to the truth? Look, really pay attention to what Peter just said here. Since you have in obedience to the truth, purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. He's saying, he's telling these people that they've got it, that they're really walking in love. How? How did they get to this place where they're free from sin and they're walking in love? Verse 22, for you have been born again, right? So we're born again by belief in Jesus Christ, not of seed, which is perishable, but imperishable. What's imperishable? That is through the living and enduring word of God. God's word is alive. When you take God's word in, it brings life to your body. Life. My words are life to those that find them and health unto all their flesh. You know what else his word is? Freedom from sin. His word is freedom from sin in you. His word will result in you actually loving your neighbor. If you're taking in his word every day, you will be free from sin. You will walk in love of neighbor. You will have the evidences that you truly are a Christian. You don't have to wonder anymore. You don't have to go back and forth anymore. Be in God's word and you will be confident knowing that you are saved and a child of God. And even John's epistles make that point that the children of God practice righteousness. How do they practice righteousness? Because they have this imperishable seed in them every day. 
and that is the living and enduring word of God. Yes. Am I preaching dependence on your own works or am I preaching dependence on God's word? On God's word. God's right. Word. So don't let anyone deceive you into thinking that this is works based salvation. No. I am telling you to take in and believe the word of God and it will automatically result in your freedom from sin and your practicing what he has said. If you really believe it, you will do it. And he will do this miracle work in you that you couldn't do before you took in the word. It don't matter if you're not taking in the word and you try and get free from addiction. Good luck. You might have seasons, but you'll always get wrapped up again. The only way to get free indefinitely and forever is abiding in the word every day. So I am not teaching works based freedom or salvation or any of those lies and nonsense. Those are lies spoken by Balaam's who are peddling the word of God for profit. And they're also captive to sin, just like Simon the sorcerer. Now I get it. Now I get what Peter, I would read that and I go, how did Peter know he's captive to sin? Because Peter wasn't. That's how he knew. I was talking to Sister Heather about this the other day. The more you're in the word, the more it becomes obvious who is and who isn't. And I'm not judging anybody. It just becomes obvious. Just because when you're all not in the word together, y'all can't tell because you're all not in the word. So you're all kind of just confused all the time and nobody can really tell anything. When you get in the word every day, it really becomes apparent. And I'm not saying that to judge. I'm saying that to encourage you get into the word because it's obvious you're not. Oof. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm not trying to be I'm not trying to crush you. I'm trying to motivate you. Folks, Peter knew that Simon the sorcerer was captive to sin. Why? He wasn't in the word. God, God knows that you are not in his word. Get in his word. Experience the freedom. How gracious and loving is God that everybody here who has been a sinner can be forgiven and free. And he's telling us exactly how. Faith in Jesus and taking his word every day. Faith in Jesus and taking his word every day. Freedom, forgiveness and freedom, both Have I not made the case with repeated scriptures that this is true? I'm not making this up. I didn't come up with this doctrine. God showed me this. And then he confirmed it by freeing me. Yes, absolutely. (laughs) What else else can I say? It's like a paralyzed man who's walking and he's like, I I mean, you say there's no God, but I mean, I'm walking. Right? Right? So you're telling me, oh, you can't be free from sin. I'm, I'm free. What are you talking about? I'm not claiming to be without sin. That's the next thing they bring up. That's why John addresses that. That's not what I'm claiming. I have sinned and I'm still capable of sin. But as you see me, I'm free. Hallelujah. I'm not lying. Now, where'd they get this from? Okay, so we see it here. The seed is the word of God. We see that the seed abiding, a person cannot go on sinning. But folks, they got it from Jesus. And that's why we need to see why Jesus, what Jesus said. Because people quote, who the sun sets free will be free indeed. Yep. And they quote it out of context all the time. <clears throat> you know what he's talking about when he says you'll be free? Sin. Sin. He's talking about freedom from sin. That's the context of that verse. Let's read it. <laughs> this, this is really where the freedom happens. The words of Jesus. All of the scriptures are God's word. Take it all in. But this is Jesus talking directly to all of us. Okay. John 8, 31. So Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed him, if you continue in my word. Everybody say my word. My word. Now notice what he said. If you continue. If you continue. Continue. Daily. Abide. Remain. If you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. And you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. Are you are you are you seeing that? Amen. Did I make that up? I like this much more. I like this more than the NIV because the NIV says if you hold to my teaching, which isn't as clear. The Greek is my word. If you hold to the word of God, you're really my disciples and you'll know the truth and the truth will make you free. John 17, 17, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. What does he say here? If you continue in my word, you're my disciples. You're an actual disciple. The people who aren't in his word all the time, but claiming to be his disciples. Um, 
That's a big maybe and a probably not. If you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. It'll be obvious to you and to everyone else. And you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. What's the truth? The word. If you continue in the word, it'll make you free. You go, well, is he talking about sin? Yes, thanks for asking. Let's continue on. Verse 33. They'd answer, they answered him, we are Abraham's descendants and have never yet been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is the slave of sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son does remain forever. So if the son makes you free, you'll be free indeed. Hallelujah. That's the context. Isn't it better when you read it in context? What does he say? If you'll continue in my word, you're my disciples. You'll know the truth and it'll make you free. And to know he's talking about sin, he says it explicitly here. Anyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. But the son, if he sets you free, you'll be free indeed. Hallelujah. His word is promised to make you free. The same miraculous promise as forgiven, the same miraculous promise as healed. You get the promise of free. God has told me to preach this in addition to healing of the body. Because that's another one that people aren't believing. He has told me to teach freedom. Why? Because if you don't believe in freedom, you might get healed at a healing meeting and you get sick again. Seven more demons will show up later because you're unoccupied. So honestly, more important is the word because even healing comes from the word. So the word first, the word first. Where do you learn about forgiveness, healing and freedom? The word. So the word first, Jesus first. Right. If you continue in my word. You are my disciples. You will know the truth. The truth will make you free. Anyone who sins is a slave to sin. Anyone who sins is a slave to sin. If you're sinning, you're enslaved. How do you get free? The word. Whose word? The son's. If the son sets you free, you'll be free indeed. How? The son. Who is the son? The word made flesh. Do you see that? He is the word. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And then verse 14, and the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Hallelujah. 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 <laughs> Jesus also shows you because he's son of man and son of God. He's both natural and divine. He shows you what the word of God in a human body will do. Oh, boy. And then as he poured the word of God into his disciples, did their bodies not do amazing things as well? Yes. Oh, boy. So the word of God in a human body will do what it did in Jesus. That's why Jesus said, you'll do the same works and greater works than these shall you do. For I'm going to the Father. Hallelujah. Amen. Did the disciples walk on water? Yeah. Yeah. When I think about Jesus saying, you know, you'll do greater works than these. I don't I can't think of a time where Jesus teleported, at least explicitly in Scripture. But Philip did. Did you know that? In the book of Acts, uh -huh. yeah. he teleported. Yeah. Poof. One place to another in an instant. Poof. That's pretty cool. <laughs> Hello. Greater works than these shall you do. What is the word of God dwelling in a person do? Oh, boy. Everything. It does everything. It's endless. Nothing is impossible. A person can teleport with the word of God in them. Is that crazy? It is in the natural. It's not crazy in the biblical. In God's word, it's not crazy. Enoch and Elijah, they just fly up phew, away with God. That's pretty crazy. The word of God dwelling in a person it's not crazy when, when the word of God is in a person. Folks, fill yourself with God's word. And who knows where he's going to take you, but it's going to be good. Do you understand? If you'll just fill and fill and fill, you'll fly. You might physically fly. Be careful. Jesus ascended into heaven. You might physically fly. You might teleport, poof, from one place to another. I don't know. <laughs> it's not like they did this stuff all the time. My point is, who knows where this will go? But if you'll take in the word, you'll be forgiven, you'll be healed, you'll be free. I know that. 
And as you pour the word into other people, they'll be forgiven, they'll be healed, they'll be free. And that's the gospel. That's the good news of the gospel. See, to get to the good news, we got to talk about how dangerous sin is. Nobody wants to talk about that. Nobody wants to talk about freedom from it because they're in it. They're a slave to sin. Whoever sins is a slave of it. Slaves don't want to talk about it. I'm serious. But when you'll just talk about it and you learn about the freedom, joy comes. Have you noticed the joy showed up? Yes. Now that we're at this part of the sermon, we need to know the bad news so we can know this good news. And joy shows up. And what's the joy? You'll be forgiven. You'll be healed. You'll be free. There's nothing impossible for the word of God in you. When it's in you, things become impossible for you, just like there's nothing impossible for God. Jesus reveals to us what the word of God accomplishes in the human body. And we see it in Peter and James and John and Paul and Barnabas and Philip and all these early apostles and disciples. The word of God in them did amazing wonders and miracles. And that's because they learned this truth that I can be free from all this stuff and I can walk in righteousness. I can walk in the righteousness that's been gifted. Yes, grace is a gift. It's gifted. Righteousness is a gift. And after it's been gifted, you can walk in it. You can actually be what's been gifted to you. Amen. You can actually be righteous by being in his word all the time, every day, never neglecting it. When the Holy Spirit says, open up Psalms and pray them, you open them and you pray them. It doesn't matter if your flesh wants to do it or not. You open them and you pray them. When you wake up in the morning, in the word, when you lie down in the word, isn't this what the scriptures say? Yes. Deuteronomy makes that case in the Shema. When you wake up, when you lie down, when you come, when you go, when you're in the streets, when you're with your children, all the time be in the word and speak the word. Right? Joshua 1, 8, meditate on it day and night. Jesus says, what? Continue, continue, continue in my word. Continue. The steak dinner you ate yesterday, you're just living on the residuals. You need to eat another dinner today. OK, the word you took in yesterday, you're living on the residuals. You need to take in the word today. Earthly food represents the word of God. That is the whole reason why God made us eat food. I'm telling you, that's why he made us eat food. So we understand how his word works. I'm telling you, that's the reason for food. You might go, oh, that's a little far. No, the manna that came from heaven. Jesus said that I am the manna and that that manna was the word of God coming from heaven. So they physically ate food and it represented taking in the word of God. That's what food represents. So if you're taking in physical food every day, you've got to take in the word of God every day. You should take it in more. In fact, the Bible teaches fasting that the word is more important than the physical food, that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Man doesn't live on bread alone, but on his word. The bread exists because his word spoke it into existence. You live on his word, whether you realize it or not. Take in his word every day and you'll be free. Aren't you sick and tired of being sick and tired and being tied up by sin, captive to sin and greed and bitterness and all these evil things? Aren't you tired? Don't you go to God? Sometimes you go, God, I just want to do what you want to do. But it seems like you can't. Well, you can if you'll get in the word every day, be in his word daily and you'll be free to run and do what Jesus has called you to do. You'll be forgiven. You'll be healed You'll be free for they shall know the truth and the truth shall make them free. Hallelujah. 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 Get free, church. Stop playing games. Be free. The disciples were free. You can be free. The disciples were healed. You can be healed. The disciples were forgiven. You can be forgiven. The whole package deal is the gospel. It's not one of those things. It's all of those things. The scriptures say that all the promises that, that God has made are yes in Christ. And to him we say, amen. Yes and amen. Romans 6. Paul came after the other disciples and he affirmed this truth as well. Romans 6, 16 through 18 and verse 22. Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, 
resulting in death, or of obedience, resulting in righteousness. What did Jesus just say in John 8? He said that if someone sins, they are a slave to sin. A slave to sin. Indicating that you should not be sinning. Because if you are, it indicates you're a slave still. And Paul affirms that. He says you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness. Don't let anyone teach you that obedience is optional. If the word of God is in you, you will obey Jesus. Amen. Obedience is not optional. It's the, it is the result of grace. That's what Paul told Titus. The grace of God has appeared teaching us to say no to ungodliness and to sin. Amen. That's the work of grace in a person is they stop sinning. They don't just get forgiven. They're delivered. They're free. Okay, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness. Verse 17, but thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed and have been freed from sin. You became slaves of righteousness. If you're in the word, you can't help but do the righteous things God has told you to do. If you're daily in it, I believe the hearers only that James talks about are the ones who come in here, maybe a sermon. They're not abiding in the word. And so they end up not doing it. They're hearers only, not doers. You become a doer. I believe it's actually automatic based on my experience. If you're in it every day, if you're meditating on it every day, if you're in it every day, as much as you can be throughout the day. And when I say as much as you can be, I mean like it takes precedence over everything else. So you make time for it. And then you also fit it in in those other times that pop up. That's what I'm saying. So Paul makes the case that people, this group he's talking to in Rome, he says, though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. What were the apostles teaching? The word of God. So these people were taking in the word of God daily and they became obedient to it and they were no longer enslaved to sin. And that's why he says in verse 18, and having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. Slaves of righteousness instead of sin sounds like a way better deal. Hallelujah. I like being a slave of righteousness. Righteousness brings peace and joy and health, long life, blessings, favor. Man, if there's anything to be enslaved to, I'd like to be enslaved to righteousness. Because it brings nothing but good into my life. And how do you become a slave of righteousness? Well, you got to get free of sin. How do you get free of sin? The word. Every day. Continue my word and you are really my disciples and you'll know the truth and the truth will make you free. And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. Isn't that good news? Look at verse 22. He says it again. But now, having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, you derive your benefit, resulting in sanctification. And the outcome? Eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Notice he says the free gift of God. Who gave you his word that you may take it in and be free? God. Am I teaching workspace salvation? No, because I didn't write the word. I didn't speak the word. I am not the originator of the word. I am simply speaking what God spoke to you. I'm not the originator. So I'm not teaching workspace salvation. It's not my word. It's not my word. I can't make you obey God anyways. I can preach the word of God to you. And his gift of his word, which is Christ Jesus in the flesh, that gift, if you will take him in every day, will make you free. That's why Paul can say both things. He can say gift of God and he can also say slave of righteousness in the same breath. How can he say that? Because he knows, as we all should know, that God's word will automatically free you. And it's a gift. My freedom from sin is a gift. I know it's not my works. I'm just taking in what he said and naturally my spirit is strengthened to do it and it brings blessing into my life. And that's, that's all I've got to tell you, folks. Amen. If you're not doing the good works that God commands, it's because you're not taking in his word. If you take in his word, not just a hearer, 
from time to time occasionally. You become a doer by dwelling in it every day. You can't help but do it. If you read it every day, you just can't help it. The Holy Spirit just puts so much strength in you to do it and quickens you and you're able to do it. So you become enslaved to God by being in his word. So much better than being enslaved to sin. And this is a gift. This is the gift of God that you could be adopted into sonship or in more human terms so that you understand. Because sometimes I think we think of adoption and we think I've been adopted. I can do what I want. That's not really. So Paul uses actually both terminologies in the same letter, adopted into sonship and also slaves of God. Both are true. We're his children. He loves us. He's given us his word. And we're literally enslaved to his will because we hear the word all the time. And that's a good thing. You're either enslaved to sin or you're enslaved to him. I'd much rather be enslaved to him. That's a slavery I will sign up for every day. Because, see, by obeying him, all he does is pour out blessing. This isn't, see, people think of like American, you know, Civil War era slavery. That's not the slavery that Jesus is talking about with us. He's talking about you become enslaved to righteousness. You become enslaved to doing good and receiving good as a result. You get what I'm saying? Like people get enslaved to money because they love to make it and spend it. And they're just, oh, oh. So you have that experience, but with something good, with righteousness. You become enslaved, just totally addicted to receiving God's word and doing it. And it's a good thing. And you receive all of its benefits. Your addiction shifts from being a substance or a pleasure to God himself. You're addicted to God. That's another way to put it. Enslaved to God rather than sin. I'm addicted to God and his word because it's so good. It's a better high than any other high. It's better than money. It's better than pleasure. He's the source of all those things anyways. So he's better. Why get enslaved to that junk when he's better? Hallelujah. If you're receiving something, say amen. Amen. All right. So if someone does commit sin, because again, I'm not preaching that it is impossible to sin. I am preaching that it is possible to not sin. Okay, how many times have I said that during the sermon? And I'll still get comments that will still say that I'm preaching works-based salvation. They will say that I'm teaching that people don't sin or, you know, can't sin or whatever. They'll they'll say all sorts of things. And it's just, I can, I just, all I can do is like pray for them. Because I could say it three, four, five times and they just won't get it. (laughs) Lord, have mercy. Grant them sight. Grant us all sight. 1 John 5, 16 through 20, okay? You can sin even after you've been free. You can walk back into your jail cell. So this is why John said this, right? This is also 1 John. This is after he talks about freedom for a while. He says this in in chapter 5, verse 16. If anyone sees his brother committing a sin not leading to death, he shall ask and God will give for him, uh, will for him give life to those who commit sin not leading to death. There is a sin leading to death. I do not say that he should make request for this. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is sin not leading to death. We know that no one who is born of God sins. Notice he's affirming that again. But he who was born of God keeps him, and the evil one does not touch him. We know that we are of God, and that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true and we are in him who is true in his son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Little children, guard yourselves from idols. So he makes the case, folks, that if anyone sees his brother committing a sin, not leading to death, he shall ask and God will give, uh, will for him give life to those who commit sin, not leading to death. In other words, Somebody could be committing a sin that leads to death. What does that mean? You might go on a shooting spree and that sin's going to lead to your death that day. But he's also, he's talking about sins that you don't die the day of committing them. He's saying that other believers can go and ask God to help them. And also elsewhere, it says that you who are spiritual restore such a person in gentleness. Okay. So we can go to a person who's caught up in sin and we can teach, right? We can teach them the word of God and help them get out of the sin. That's what he's saying. So a person can still get caught up in sin, but you can help them get out. And the scriptures talk about this. So I'm preaching this because I'm hoping to help you get out. 
And I hope if you ever see me caught up in sin, that you'll help me get out. Because sin can ensnare, and you become kind of blind and, and just ensnared. Even as a Christian who's been free before, you can, you, can, you can lose sight of God's word if you're not in it. So if you notice another believer who's not in it, man, speak it to them and gently restore them and help them. God will forgive them and he'll free them again. But sometimes they need a little help from a fellow believer. Hence why God said, preach this. Because we all need help. That's why God created the church so we can all check each other and help each other and be there. Especially when someone's caught up in sin. Now here's what happens if we don't stop sinning. And this is why you should be motivated to teach the truth. Okay? All right. You want to teach the truth because this is what happens if we don't teach people freedom from sin. If you don't get free by being in the Word of God, this is the warnings to you. 2 Peter 2, starting at verse 19 through 22. This is actually Peter still, we we read part of it earlier about false teachers or even false believers. This is Peter's talking about that situation still. Okay, verse 19, promising them freedom while they themselves are slaves of corruption. That's the first sign that they're promising freedom, but they're enslaved. Okay, for by what a man is overcome, by this he is enslaved. Notice how we've been talking about this slavery to sin a lot. Jesus did, Paul did, Peter did. How do you get free? The word of God. Verse 20, for if after they have escaped the defilements of the world by the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and are overcome, the last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would be better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn away from the holy commandment handed on to them. It has happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog returns to its own vomit and a sow after washing returns to wallowing in the mire. Pay attention to what was just said. For if after, everybody say after. After After they've escaped the defilements of the world by the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This is talking about a born again. This is after knowing Jesus. This is after They are again entangled in them and are overcome. In what? Sin. And are overcome. This means they die in it. They die in a state of adultery. This is dangerous. Can I can I share something with you? Are you guys still receiving? Yes. John the Baptist. Do you know why he was beheaded? Because Herod took Herodias to be his wife. And Herodias was his brother Philip's wife. And in the eyes of God, the two become one flesh. Divorce does not mean you're divorced. And so he said to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And this is while they were living married. He still called her Philip's wife. Herodias hated that so much. That's the grudge that was nursed that she then had him beheaded later in the story. That's that perpetual state of sin that I'm talking about. We're not talking about the woman who was caught in adultery and was told, go now and leave your life of sin, and did. She received the word, and I imagine stayed in it. I'm talking about Herodias who lives in adultery and will not repent, that person has been entangled and is overcome to the point of murdering God's prophet, the last Old Testament prophet, murdered again. Why? Because the last state has become worse for them than the first. Folks, if we don't help Herodias come out of her sinful marriage, she's going to be condemned. You're not being judgmental. John wasn't being judgmental by saying, hey, it's not lawful for you two to be married. 
you're not actually married in the eyes of God. There's a lot of marriages in the Christian church that biblically, if we went through Jesus' teachings in 1 Corinthians 7, Paul's teachings on marriage, they wouldn't be allowed to be married. And yet they are. And they're in a perpetual state of sin. And they wonder why their life is so chaotic. They have a chaotic life. And they wonder why. Why is my life so chaotic? Because they're living in an adulterous marriage. And John, who loved them enough to tell them, he said, you got to stop that marriage. She's got to go back to Philip. She's his wife. That was true of Bathsheba. Even when she slept with David, she was still your eye's wife, the Bible says. It don't matter if it's been one night or 100 nights. Still your eye's wife. This is what he's talking about. They are again entangled in them and are overcome. The last state has become worse for them than the first. See, if people were dwelling in God's word, even someone like Herodias, who's different from the woman caught in adultery, this is the woman living in adultery. They're two different women. If Herodias would be in the word of God, if she would have listened and sat at the feet of John and at the feet of Jesus, she would have been freed from that. She would have, without pulling teeth, without anger, left and gone back to her husband. In fact, I recently married a woman who God revealed this to her on her own by being in his word that the marriage she entered into with her second husband was an adulterous marriage because her first husband was a believer, not an unbeliever, but a believer. Paul says that if an unbeliever divorces a believer, that they are no longer bound in 1 Corinthians 7. Okay, But she was married to a believer, left him herself, divorced him, then married an unbeliever and had constant chaos. Her husband was in jail, all kinds of stuff. She repented because God revealed to her through his word, not through even talking to me, just through his word, that she needed to go back to her husband if he would take her. And lo and behold, he took her and forgave her, and she's now pregnant with their child. Isn't that beautiful? She did what Herodias wouldn't. She took in the word of God and she believed it, and she was freed from her sin. Hallelujah. Verse 21, For it would be better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn away from the holy commandment handed on to them. It would have been better for them not to know than to know it and turn their backs on it. It'd be better, it's easier to start with someone who doesn't know Jesus than someone who does and they think they've got it all figured out and they're living in sin so they won't listen. It's easier. It's easier to talk to a brand new person who just has not heard the gospel or who has never become a Christian, even if they've heard it. <coughs> Why? Because once a person knows the way of righteousness and has turned their backs on it, man, it's tough to get through to that person. It's tough. It's tough for Herodias, who has a new marriage for X amount of years, to come out of her sin. It's just tough. Do you, I'm being real with y'all. Do you see what I'm talking about? How many women are willing to do that? I mean, the woman that I know that did do that, she's the exception, man. But it also reveals that we're not in the word because if we're in the word, we'd know the truth. We'd know all the laws of marriage. We wouldn't get into these adulterous marriages in the first place. We also would know that if we were in one, we'd come out of it. Any man who marries a divorced woman commits adultery, the Bible says. Jesus said it. Not just the Bible. Let me make that clear. Jesus said it. And he said it multiple times in multiple gospels. Now, are there releases? Yes. Read 1 Corinthians 7. The unbelieving spouse divorces the believing spouse, says they are not enslaved in the Greek. They are not enslaved. They are not bound. Okay. But with two believers, you betcha, you are one flesh till one of you dies. Particularly the husband, if you understand biblical law. So how many people are living in adulterous marriage, attending a church where the pastor will affirm their adulterous marriage and will not call them to freedom. And that same pastor probably sells tickets to events, sells books, sells sermons. Probably the same guy. And if you've been in the church long enough, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And now Peter is becoming more clear on how to discern who Balaam is 
who Balaam is and who the real preachers are. God's word will set you free. Amen. Hebrews 10, 26 through 31. Why is this so important that we don't continue in sin? Well, here's the warning. Here's the warning. This is a rebuke. This is a rebuke. This is not judgment. This is a rebuke. Leave your life of sin. That's what this is. Verse 26. For if we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. Is that a terrifying statement or what? It should be. See, pastors should be way more afraid of this happening to their parishioners than their parishioners leaving and not tithing anymore. They should be way more afraid that their parishioners are going to hell than that their parishioners will stop tithing and leave the church. Would you agree that the greater fear should be the person going to hell than the person being offended? Absolutely. You want Herodias to go to heaven and she's on her way to hell. And then it was compounded by murdering John. For if we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a terrifying expectation of the judgment and the fury of a fire which will consume the adversaries. Anyone who set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much severer or how much more severe Punishment, do you think he will deserve who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has insulted the Spirit of grace? See, we regard God's word as unclean. His commands as unclean. Oh, if he says, you know, this is a sin and we currently sin that way, we go, oh, that's unclean. That's not right. And that's the word of God, folks, spoken to you. And you insult the Spirit of grace by doing that. These are powerful words. This is the word of God. We need to know. Verse 30, for we know him who said, vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Why am I motivated to teach people freedom from sin? Because I know these passages. I know that the word says, for if we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. That is some heavy stuff. And even once you're free from sin, which I celebrate, I also mourn this. This is somber. I realize that there are a lot of people that are confessing Christ, but they are not in the word. And so they're not free from sin. They're not really serving him. And they're probably not saved. And it's our duty as Christians to free others. As Jesus sets one slave free, go free the other slaves. I have come to set the captives free. Do you realize what he was talking about there? He was talking about captive to sin. I've come to set people who are captive to sin free from sin. I've come to give sight to the blind. Yeah, the physically blind, but also the spiritually blind to help them see. To proclaim good news to the poor. Yes, physically poor, sure, but all of us are poor in spirit, poor in knowledge, poor in righteousness. And he came to proclaim the good news. And what's the good news? What have we been talking about? Forgiven, healed, free by Jesus Christ and his word, because he is the word made flesh. I want to leave this with you. Read John 8 every day, every day. Until you experience the freedom that's promised there, read that it's promised to you. That's part of walking in it. If you hold to my word, if you continue in my word, you, will, you are really my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. Amen. Everyone who sins is a slave to sin. But if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. What's the truth? God's word. What do you need to be in every day? God's word. What's the seed? God's word. Who is Jesus? The word made flesh. How do you get free? How do you get healed? How do you get forgiven? The word preached to you and also you go and preach to yourself, folks. Read this word out loud. Preach to yourself. <laughs> Hear the word every day and you will be free from sin. Hallelujah. Did I teach you any falsehoods today or did I show you the word of God? Don't let anyone deceive you. 
The one who does what is righteous is righteous, just as Jesus is righteous. That's what John's epistle says. So if you do what's righteous, then you are really doing what God has commanded. Now, I'll leave you with this. What is righteousness? Righteousness is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hangs on loving God. And then because God is the spirit and we don't physically see him right now, you love your neighbor as yourself because they are made in his image. And your expression of love to them is love unto him. That's why you can just say love your neighbor as yourself and you actually fulfill love God as well. So love your neighbor as yourself. How did Jesus define loving your neighbor as yourself? Again, be in the word. You'll know these things. You'll dwell on these things. Jesus said, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, for this fulfills the law and the prophets. Do to others as you would have them do unto you. You know that starts by speaking with speaking truth. It does. It does. If you were Herodias, do you want John to come and tell you the truth so that you've got a chance? Yes. Yes. Yes, so I can be free, so I can be forgiven and free, okay? If you were caught up in any sort of sexual sin, financial sin, bitterness, do you, if you're thinking clearly, would you want someone to come and tell you the truth so you could get free? Absolutely. Yes, forgiven and free. Yes, so speak the truth in love. That's what Ephesians says. But on top of that, if you're hungry, would you want someone to feed you? Yes. If you're thirsty, would you want someone to give you a drink? Yes. If you're naked, would you want someone to clothe you? If you're sick or in prison, would you want someone to visit you? Amen. Yes? You. If you're, if you're uh, a stranger or a foreigner, would you want someone to invite you in and make you welcome? Yes. 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 Okay. <laughs> Jesus said, whatever you've done in the least of these, you've done unto me. In Matthew 25. Matthew 25 is the final judgment. It's the result of being in God's word. If you are in God's word, number one, you'll come across Matthew 25 <laughs> sooner or later. But number two, you'll end up loving your neighbor. And whether you know the doctrine or not, you'll end up doing the things that are in Matthew 25. For I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick or in prison and you visited me. I was a stranger and you invited me in. Jesus, when do we see you? Hungry or thirsty or naked or, uh, or sick or in prison or a stranger and did not minister unto you. He says, Whenever, whatever you did not do unto the least of these, you did not do unto me. So folks, all this should result in love of neighbor. Your freedom, if you're really free, you'll know you're free because you're not committing sins. You filled your time with loving your neighbor instead of sinning. There it is. Amen. Instead of sinning, you filled your time with love of neighbor. You read John's epistle. Read 1 John. In fact, read all three. It won't take you long, but read 1 John. He makes the case for freedom from sin and love of neighbor. That's like his whole thing for the whole letter it's freedom from sin and love of neighbor. In fact, he says that you, you, you know that the love of God is in you if you're loving your neighbors. That's how you know. Go read 1 John 3, 16. In fact, we can read it. Let's just, let's just close with it. We'll close with 1 John 3. All right, because we read 1 John 3 earlier. Here we go, verse 14. We know that we've passed out of death into life because we love the brethren. How do you know? Because you admire Jesus, because you pay him lip service. Oh, Jesus is Lord. That's why Jesus said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who's in heaven. And then the one who's going to do the will of the Father in heaven is the one who's listening to his word every day. Then you will do what it says because you're hearing it. I'm telling you, it'll push out all the evil. It just does. We know we've passed out passed out of death into life because we love the brethren. He who does not love abides in death. Abides in it. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. See, let's use Herodias again. She murdered John, didn't she? Why'd she murder John? Before she ever murdered John, she was a murderer in the eyes of God. How? Because she wouldn't take in the word of God and be free from her sin. And not being free led to her adulterous marriage and her adulterous marriage led to actual physical murder. Is that wild? And it all sources back to not listening to God. Eve ate the fruit because she didn't listen to God. Adam ate the fruit because he didn't listen to God. Everybody sins because they're not listening to God. That's the problem. Listen to God, you'll be free. Hallelujah. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. 
We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? Little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and truth. We will know by this that we are of the truth and will assure our hearts before him. I believe again that's where that ends, (laughs) period. Folks, we know that we're the Lord's because we're loving our neighbors. And the real test of whether you love your neighbors is whether you're using the world's goods to help people. And I said this a couple weeks ago. If you really, really, really want to lay hands on sick cancer babies and see them healed, then you must be giving money right now to see them healed. Because that's what reveals to you, God, everyone, whether you really love your neighbor or not. Use what you have to express love and God will give you more. Not just money but power. He'll give you power. Amen? Amen. Did you receive something this morning? Yes. Praise God, you can stop sinning. Isn't that good news? Hallelujah. That's good news. Yes. You should be as excited about that news as you are about you can be forgiven of sin, that you can actually stop it. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Those of you online, thank you very much for joining us. We love you guys and appreciate the online community. If you'd like to support this ministry on YouTube, there's a little heart icon that you can click and you can give a gift or you can give whether you're here in person or online. You can give by texting the word give to 386-753-7337. You can select Ormond Church and give to the ministry that way. We're so grateful for your generosity because you help the word to go out. Thank you for meeting our physical needs as we help to meet your spiritual needs.